All right, welcome back clinical problem solvers. This is Jack here, and I am really excited to get to talk with you today about ways to think about some of the more sinister complications of a sore throat. This talk today serves as a supplement to our schema on the website and the app that goes through the potential causes of a sore throat. Now, the vast majority of the time, those diseases that cause a sore throat, usually infections, can be treated with some combination of supportive care and occasionally antibiotics. However, there's a small portion of patients whose sore throat signifies a much more sinister and concerning underlying disease. And that's gonna be the focus of our talk today. We're gonna to talk about what the different anatomical structures are that influence whether or not there is potentially a sinister underlying disease underneath the individual's sore throat. And we're gonna talk about what some of the warning signs and symptoms are that clue us in to the fact that this sore throat that, this patient, that our patient has isn't actually a run-of-the-mill sore throat, but is one that is a signifying a more sinister underlying disease process. And to do that, we're gonna talk about two foods, onions and potatoes. And if you're like, Jack, wait a second, what, what do onions and potatoes have to do with the evaluation of a sore throat? Well, by the end of these next 10 minutes, you'll have a clear idea of what that is. So first, let's just take some time to understand the anatomy of the oropharynx, the retropharyngeal space, and the other structures that can be involved when these run-of-the-mill sore throats progress to more serious underlying infections. So we'll turn our attention to this diagram here. And again, this is a sagittal view of the head, neck, and thorax that is gonna help us understand where sore throat infections can extend into that can lead to these more sinister underlying complications of a sore throat. And this is where our first food comes in, which is onions. If you've seen the movie Shrek, you remember Shrek telling that ogres have layers, just like onions. And in the same way that ogres have layers, the structures of our head and neck also have layers to them. And those layers play a significant role in understanding what the potential complications of a throat infection are. So if we look at the diagram here, there are four key layers to think about in addition to the airway itself, all right? So first off, when we think about what some of the complications of a throat infection can be, we have to first think about the possibility of airway compromise. If there is significant tonsillar or pharyngeal swelling, that can lead to obstruction of the airway and impending airway compromise, which can be a medical emergency. In addition, we have these different layers of tissue that can also become involved if that infection of the throat extends into these different soft tissues. The first layer is going to be the submandibular space, and this, sit, this sits underneath our chin and in the anterior portion of our neck. When infections move from the throat to the submandibular space, that's usually what we call Ludwig's angina, for example. Now, moving behind the throat, we get into the first space, which is the retropharyngeal space. And the retropharyngeal space runs behind the pharynx all the way through the soft tissue structures of the neck. It gets close to many different vessels within the neck. And so some of the infections that can involve the retropharyngeal space include things like a retropharyngeal retrofer abscess. And sometimes that inflammation can lead to the development of a blood clot in one of the jugular veins, an extension of the infection into those venous structures. And this you might have sometimes heard of termed Lemire syndrome or internal jugular vein septic thrombophlebitis. This develops because an infection has spread from the pharynx into the retropharyngeal space. Now behind the retropharyngeal space is this red area here, which is called the danger space. And the danger space is so scary because as you can see, it runs all the way down through the thoracic cavity. So if an infection moves from the pharynx through the retropharyngeal space and extends into this danger space, it can run straight down into the mediastinum and cause mediastinitis. Now, very rarely, infections can move even one more layer back into this orange area here, which is called the prevertebral space. And the prevertebral space runs all the way along the spinal column. 
And so this is a very, very rare space for throat infections to move into because it has to track back through many layers. But when that does happen, right, we run the risk of developing osteomyelitis of the spine anywhere along the cervical, thoracic, and even down into the lumbrosacral spine because this space runs all the way down the vertebral column. So again, the layers of the onion of head and neck infections include the submandibular space where we get Ludwig's angina, the retropharyngeal space where we can get things like a retropharyngeal abscess or Lemire syndrome, the danger space where we can get extension into the mediastinum, and then very rarely the prevertebral space where we can go all the way down the thoracic column. And of course, we don't want to forget about the air-filled layer, which is going to be the airway, where we can get things like a peritonsillar abscess and potential airway obstruction as well. So now that we understand what these different layers of the onion of head and neck infections are, let's turn our attention to think about what are some of the signs and symptoms that could clue us in to these infections being present. So just take a couple seconds, pause the video here, and ask yourself, what are some signs and symptoms that I might worry about that could clue me in to one of these complications of a run-of-the-mill sore throat? All right, so we're gonna take those things that you just thought about and organize them into two primary symptom categories. Symptoms of airway obstruction and symptoms of a deep space infection. Now, the symptoms of airway obstruction bring us into our second food. We talked about how the layers of the onion represent the layers of head and neck infections. And now we're gonna talk about how potatoes can be a sign of airway obstruction. Sometimes when individuals have significant swelling of the posterior pharynx from these head and neck infections, they can develop what's called a hot potato voice. Now, if you've ever taken a bite of a baked potato or a mashed potato that's just too hot, you may have hot to talk like close in order to try to cool down the food in your mouth. And that voice, talking like this, is what we call a hot potato voice. And it has to do with not being able to phonate well as a result of the swelling in the back of the throat. So if you hear things like a hot potato voice, or you notice that your patient is having difficulty managing their secretions, there's lots of saliva in their mouth or they're potentially drooling. If you hear stridor or shortness of breath because of that, because of that airway obstruction, and if you notice that your patient may be in a position where they're trying to open the airway, which we call a sniffing position, where they may be tipping their chin and their nose forward to try to open up that airway as much as possible, or tripoding, putting their hands on their thighs and trying to open up their chest to be able to breathe well, these are all very concerning symptoms that there could be impending airway obstruction. So any one of these symptoms tells us that this is a warning sign that this is a severe head and neck infection and that this patient needs urgent evaluation and management. Now, sometimes these airway obstructing symptoms aren't present, but there are symptoms of a deep space infection of the neck. So let's think through what some of those symptoms might be. The first is if there's unilateral severe pain in the throat. Most individuals who have a sore throat will experience a general midline sensation of pain in the back of the throat. If that pain moves to one side and starts to feel really, really severe, right, that unilaterality raises the probability of a deep space infection. Other things that you may see include, include swelling. And that could be swelling of the oropharynx. When we look in their mouth, you may see swelling of the soft palate, significant swelling of the tonsils, and even potentially bulging or signs of an abscess in the oropharynx. And sometimes we also see that swelling in structures of the neck, right? Like in the submandibular space, which we talked about in Ludwig's angina, or you may see fullness and swelling on one side of the neck, right? That can also clue us in to a deep space infection. Another symptom that clues us into a deep space infection is what's called trismus. And trismus is the finding of severe pain when individuals try to open their mouth. So if you ask your patient to open their mouth so that you can look in the back of their throat and they can only move their jaw a few centimeters because it's so, so painful, we call that trismus and that's also a sign of a deep space infection. And then finally, if somebody has a sore throat and they're really, really sick, that is quite concerning for an underlying, either uncontained focus of infection or an infection that has spread throughout the structures of the head and neck, right? So if you see things like, like high fevers, 
rigors, a really high white count in the setting of a sore throat, that's also another warning sign that we take really seriously. So now that we understand what those warning signs are, let's think about what tests and what evaluation and management we may need to do in order to diagnose and treat these possible infections. There's gonna be two key steps and they are going to involve airway management and imaging. The airway management is gonna be of particular priority if we have signs of airway obstruction, right? This swelling within the oropharynx runs the possibility of occluding the airway, which would cause a medical emergency. And so when you see signs of airway obstruction, prioritize looping in your ENT colleagues from the, for them to do an evaluation of the structures of the head and neck and potentially secure the patient's airway if needed. The other thing we need to do is we need imaging to be able to understand where the infection may have extended to through these different layers. And for that, we're gonna get a CT neck with contrast, and sometimes we may run it all the way down to the chest, particularly if you're worried about extension of the infection into the danger space. All right, CP solvers, that covers it. So when you think about the evaluation of possible warning signs of a sore throat, again, these are the signs and symptoms that clue us in to the possibility that a run-of-the-mill sore throat has actually moved into a more severe complication of a throat infection. I want you to think about onions and potatoes. The onions relate to the layers of infection where we can see things like Ludwig's angina, a retropharyngeal abscess, or the Mears syndrome, a infection of the danger space. And then the potatoes relate to the warning signs, things like a hot potato voice or signs of a deep space neck infection. And whenever you have concern for any of these underlying infections, right, we want to think about ENT evaluation, airway management, as well as cross-sectional imaging of the neck with contrast to get a view of where that infection could be. All right, clinical problem solvers, that covers it. Thank you so much for tuning into this video today. If you liked the video, please do share your feedback with a like and or a comment below. And if you have suggestions on how to make these videos better or more useful for you, please do let us know. We would love to hear your feedback. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next time.